thanks to Song and David for inviting me, inviting me and hosting me. Uh, it's always uh, fun to come back to Stony Brook. Uh, I spend a lot of time. So, um, uh, as in the title, it's a somewhat modest title, I think, because uh, there are many models of the 3D Euler equation. This is yet another one. Um, and what I want to try and persuade you is that this one captures more of the features of 3D Euler than some of the other ones. Um, but of course, there are lots of arguments about what is the correct one. Uh, so, we'll start with discussing the 3D Euler equation. Um, so, we have a, an ideal fluid filling up some three dimensional domain. Uh, typically, the domain I'm interested in, uh, and I'll be more specific about this later, um, is a solid torus, so uh, a cylinder with the uh, top and bottom identified. Uh, just to, to avoid as much boundary issues, um, as many boundary issues as I can. Uh, so that's typically my situation, but most of this works in any situation. So U satisfies the uh, Euler equation, velocity field. Um, this le left hand side is the acceleration, and the right side is the gradient of the pressure. Uh, and pressure is very mysterious. It's determined non locally, uh, essentially by this condition that the divergence of U should be zero. Uh, so if I want to actually solve for the pressure, I take the divergence of both sides, and since the divergence of U is zero, the divergence of this is zero, and I get this equation, uh, elliptic equation for P. Um, in addition, if I want to solve for P, I need some boundary condition, and that's also specified by the condition that U be tangent to the boundary. The fluid can't flow through the boundary uh, or go outside. I have a rigid boundary. Um, so U must be tangent to the boundary, and so again, I can take the dot product of both sides of this with normal, and this term disappears. And so I get a boundary condition for the pressure, uh, and that uniquely specifies, so this boundary, this Neumann boundary condition and this uniquely specify um, the pressure up to a constant, and therefore the gradient of the pressure uniquely. So I start with some divergence-free initial velocity field. I solve this Neumann problem at the initial time step to get the gradient of the pressure, and then I step forward using that pressure to get a new velocity field, and then keep solving that way. Um, and so of course that makes things very complicated, uh, and if I compare this to studying other sorts of PDEs, usually the, every term in the PDE Maybe it's a complicated function of my variables, but it's some function of the variables. And so if I have something happening at a single point, uh, or in a neighborhood of a point, then all the influences will, ha will happen also in the neighborhood of, of that point. Uh, but this is difficult because if I change the velocity anywhere, or if I have a non-zero velocity anywhere, then immediately the pressure everywhere is non-zero. And uh, so I don't have, say, finite um, speed of uh, uh, I don't have finite sound speed, and everything's immediately influencing everything else. Uh, and that makes things very difficult to analyze by compared to standard PDEs. And of course, uh, all PDEs have their own difficulties, but this is um, kind of a special pain. Uh, we do have a local well in this result. This is well known um, due to many authors. Uh, so it dates back to the 20s and uh, has been refined in various ways. So if you start with um, an initial velocity that's smooth enough, so a little bit better than C1. I could take C1 plus alpha, I could take HS, and this is a mistake. This should be S, so Sobolev space S, greater than dimension of the manifold over 2 plus 1. Forgot the plus 1 there. Um, but if I start with, and, and that's the, the necessary condition on a Sobolev space to be embedded in C1. Uh, so I just need a little bit better than C1. If I have a little bit better than C1, then whatever smoothness you u0 has, u of t will have the same smoothness for some short time. Uh, and in addition, I can make u of t, uh, the, the dependence uh, of, u, of u of t on u0 is continuous. Unfortunately, I can't do any better than that. Um, in fact, u, u of t is not even uh, uniformly continuous as a function of u0. So continuity is all I get. Um, but I'll talk a little bit later about the, the uh, Lagrangian version of this. Okay, so this goes back originally to Volibner. Um, Ed, uh, David Evan and, uh, and Jerry Marsden in 1970 had uh, probably one of the, um, the earliest proofs of this and then using geometric techniques and then Kato proved it a little bit later um, with more pure PE techniques. The uh, big open question is, as David said, um, whether U of T remains smooth for all time. 
Uh, and in dimension two, this is known to be true, has been known for a long time, um, but unknown for dimension three or anything higher. Uh, if you have viscosity, this is a millennium problem. I would like to say that the Euler version is a millennium problem, but it is very specific in the rules of the millennium problems that zero viscosity does not count. Still hard, but does not count, uh, unfortunately. So even for axisymmetric fluids, uh, if you kill off, so in this situation, for example, if I imagine that nothing depends on the angular variable, uh, I've reduced it to basically two-dimensional, but not quite. And even in that situation, the, the problem's wide open. Uh, and in fact, the most recent results, recent numerical results, uh, very, very convincing due to Luo and Ho, uh, give in a situation on, in this situation, uh, there's a numerical blow up. Right? So very convincing evidence of numerical blow up as of last year, um, but still not proved. So uh, as I mentioned, the, vortex, the pressure makes everything really, really difficult because it's not local. So one of the first things you'd like to do is take the curl to kill that gradient. That's why curls were invented, of course, to kill gradients, uh, especially in equations like this. So if I take the curl, I get, a, um, I get an equation for the vorticity omega. In two dimensions, the curl is a function. In three dimensions, the curl is a vector field, which seems like a minor sort of difference, but changes everything. Um, because the fact that you have a vector field uh, allows things to be stretched. Whereas if you have a function, there's no stretching that can happen. Uh, so the equation is pretty similar in vorticity form, uh, just whether you apply the vector field to the function or whether you take the uh, commutator of the vector field with another vector field. If you know omega, the vorticity, then you can reconstruct u because you know the divergence of u is zero and the curl of u is something. And so by the B.O. of R law, you can reconstruct u. Um, but of course, that's non-local, right? To, to, to get the, uh, the B.O. of R law, um, which is the thing we want to model in our one-dimensional situation. So like I said, if dimension is two, then omega is a function transported by the flow. If dimension is three, it's a vector field that can be stretched. And the importance of this is the Bielkato Maida theorem, uh, one of the most well known results about blow up, which is if you know that omega uh, has L infinity norm that's bounded up to some time t, then you can continue the solution past time t and you can get all the derivatives for free. So, so all you need is control over just the C1 norm, basically. So, in terms of interpreting these equations, so uh, U is acting as a differential operator on omega in that first equation, yes. and it, the second, it's a, you have a Lie bracket? Right. The commutator is the Lie bracket. It's not some. Yeah. Uh, okay, so I want to look at this from the Lagrangian point of view. It's a little more geometric and uh, captures some more of the structure. Um, makes things a little bit simpler in some ways and more difficult in other ways. Uh, if you have, so if you have a vector field, you can follow the particles of the fluid uh, as they move. So if I, if I um, if I'm looking from the vector field point of view, then I'm imagining looking at a fixed point in space and there are various fluid particles moving through and each of them has some velocity and I just watch that velocity change. Uh, in the Lagrangian point of view, I look at some particle and watch it go through the fluid. Um, and so if I collect all those particles together, I get a family of diffeomorphisms uh, of the fluid. So if I denote this diffeomorphism by eta, then I satisfy the flow equation. I might as well start at the identity. Uh, and the Euler equation becomes this, which is a little bit simpler, because uh, the left-hand side has turned into just a second derivative. Uh, of course, the right-hand side has gotten a little more complicated. Instead of just the gradient, I have the gradient composed with eta. Um, so the Euler equation is, of course, difficult because it's nonlinear. And I've got a quadratic nonlinearity, um, which is bad, right? Quadratic nonlinearities can cause blow up, possibly. Um, here, I've simplified the left-hand side, but a composition nonlinearity is much harder to deal with. Um, the, the composition, are you saying you, you pull back by the diffeomorphism, or, I mean? Uh, no, I just take this gradient, this vector field, and compose it with eta on the right. So it's a, it's a right translation in the group. <coughs> uh, so the divergence free condition on U becomes the uh, Jacobian condition. So incompressibility is expressed by the determinant of this matrix is one. Or in other words, if I pull back the volume form, it's preserved uh, under the, the flow. And so the first uh, equation, you're, you're saying you think of eta as just an element of the diffeomorphism group? And yes. 
So it's, it's an element of the volume preserving diffeomorphism group. Um, and if I solve the vorticity equation in terms of the flow, I get this fairly simple expression. Uh, omega is just transported by the flow, and the only, the only way I can transport a function is just by composition. Um, but I can transport a vector field by actually pushing forward under this diffeomorphism, and that's what allows for the stretching. So here, omega cannot possibly grow, uh, and therefore I automatically get global existence by the Biel-Kato minor in two dimensions. In three dimensions, this d eta uh, can possibly stretch. I really have very little control over it, and so that allows for the vorticity growth. Um, and one thing you should notice, so typically in, in most models of the Euler equation, uh, you really want to capture this sort of equation. So you want to see omega stretching. Like whatever your omega is in your model, you want to allow for it to stretch in some way. But notice, because the determinant is one, uh, stretching of eta is the same thing as shrinking, right? Because if d eta is going to infinity in one direction, this matrix, uh, then it must have some other eigenvalue going to zero. Um, and so, if I want to prove blow up, I can either look at d eta going to infinity or d eta going to zero. Most people look at d eta going to infinity. But in this talk, I'm going to discuss uh, basically modeling d eta going to zero, um, which of course is the same thing. So if I differentiate this in space, I get this equation. And you should think of this as basically being the Jacobi equation, right? Because so, there really is a lot of Riemannian geometry in here. And this Hessian of the pressure is effectively a Riemannian curvature, um, which is an interpretation you can take very seriously, and it really works all the way up. Um, so I can think of this as a linear ODE along a single particle path. Linear ODEs are fairly easy to study. Of course, I've got this nonlinear part because of the composition. But if I imagine somehow that the pressure is handed down from on high, um, then d eta just satisfies this very simple equation. So um, the simplest thing I can do, even that equation is pretty difficult to study because of the composition. I can get rid of the composition because I can assume that I have a very special sort of flow. Like, for, an, for example, if I have an axisymmetric flow, then the axis is preserved. And so if I start with a particle path, say, on the axis, it will remain on the axis. And then my composition is a lot simpler, right? I'm only dealing with the possible one-dimensional flow along the axis. And I can make things even simpler. I can say, suppose the, uh, the fluid velocity is initially odd, then it will remain odd for all time. And so, for example, I can imagine, say, everything pointing towards the, the axis at zero, and then that axis will be preserved as well. So if I have those two conditions, uh, then this point is fixed by the flow. No matter what's happening, this particle always stays right there at the origin. The same thing happens at the boundary. right? Since the boundary is preserved by the flow, if a particle starts on the boundary, it stays there. And if I have oddness, then the particle will stay at the same z level as well. Um, so those two conditions, uh, either at um, radius 0 or radius 1, the radius will stay fixed. Uh, here I'm denoting the radial component of the diffeomorphism by alpha. And like I said, if you have oddness, then z equals 0 will be a fixed point. And so at the origin, uh, I define some function rho of t, which is the alpha r component. Right? And I want to see alpha r either going to infinity or going to 0 for blow up, because that's one of the components of the d eta, d eta matrix. So I can write an ODE for this, uh, this term in terms of the mysterious pressure Hessian. Uh, no composition, though, but I don't know what PRR is. Um, but if I knew it, I would have this equation, which is called the ermakov finney equation. And what's really nice about ermakov finney um, you can imagine if I didn't have this B0 term, so the B0 term represents swirl, the, the vorticity along the axis. If I didn't have that, I would have a fairly simple linear equation for rho. And it would describe, say, a harmonic oscillator with some force that's maybe returning me to the origin. And I'd be looking for, if I start with uh, rho somewhere, does the, is the force strong enough to take me into the origin in finite time? Which is relatively easy. Um, if I add this on, it makes things more complicated, but it really only changes the picture into uh, a planar harmonic oscillator. And now I'm going to imagine that I've got some uh, rho is the radius of a particle in the plane, has some central force, and I'm asking 
So v0 is the angular velocity, which is conserved. And I'm asking whether it goes to the origin. And that's flow. Right? So a fairly simple uh, picture of it. Now, um, what, so my perspective on this, um, inspired by David, of course, is, uh, is to look at the Euler equation as a geodesic in an infinite dimensional uh, group. So Arnold first noticed in 1966 that the Euler equation is formally a geodesic in the group of volume-preserving diffeomorphisms with uh, a Riemannian metric that's defined by kinetic energy. Um, so fluids locally minimize length that's determined by kinetic energy. And really, the only constraint, the only thing that prevents everything from just going in a straight line is this volume-preserving constraint. So I'm on some sub-manifold of a flat space. Uh, and I follow a geodesic pair. Uh, Evan and Marston in 1970 proved that um, you can take this perspective very seriously. So it's not just formally a geodesic equation, but if you actually look at this as a um, Hilbert manifold of HS uh, diffeomorphisms, then the geodesic equation is actually smooth. Um, so the PDE turns into an actual ODE, uh, and that changes everything, right? Because solving a PDE requires some difficult estimates, mollifiers, all, all these sort of standard techniques. Um, but solving an ODE, there's only one theorem in the entire field of ODEs, which is the fundamental theorem of local existence uh, via Picard iteration. And so basically what Evan and Marston proved is that uh, Picard iteration works for the Euler equation, um, which nobody expected until it worked. Um, and what that implies is that if you consider uh, the ODE solution map, which takes your initial velocity uh, to a final position, a final diffeomorphism configuration, uh, that map is smooth. So the map from uh, u0 to eta is smooth. If you know eta, you can reconstruct the velocity field. Um, and you, you might hope that that's also smooth. But reconstructing the velocity field uh, relies on this equation. I have to take a time derivative and then apply a composition. And that composition is terrible. That composition is not a smooth operator uh, in a Sobolev space. And that's why, even though the eta is smooth, uh, the u is only continuous. That composition is, uh, breaks everything. So I've now got a smooth exponential map on some Hilbert manifold. Uh, I take its derivative, and I will get a linear map um, from one Hilbert space to another. So I can ask, how nice is this linear map? Is it invertible? Maybe, maybe, maybe not. Um, if it's not invertible, uh, then there are conjugate points by definition of what conjugate points are. Um, so probably it's not because there is some positive curvature. There are conjugate points on this group. Uh, but I can ask, how bad are these conjugate points? Is this kernel of this map finite dimensional or infinite dimensional? If the kernel is finite dimensional, I can ask if the co-kernel is also finite dimensional. Um, and I can also ask, how can I actually find singular points? So uh, kernel and co-kernel being finite dimensional uh, is, by definition, fretfulness of the exponential map. Uh, David and I and Garrett and Siolek proved that uh, the exponential map is fretholm in two dimensions um, if your boundary is empty. Uh, in three dimensions, we know it's not. Uh, it, we just, so actually, Garrett and I just recently proved uh, that even if the boundary is not empty, uh, the exponential map is still fret home. Surprisingly tricky. Um, in dimension two. In dimension two, yeah. Uh, and in 3D, it's just a disaster. It fails in the most spectacular way you can imagine. Um, so not only are there uh, some infinite dimensional kernels, but pretty much everything's infinite dimensional right away. Um, and in fact, I have a paper from 2010 which relates uh, the failure of fret homeness in 3D to blow up. Essentially, the, uh, the Bill Cato Mida criterion on growth of vorticity also relates to how many conjugate points you have along a geodesic. Um, but I'm not going to discuss that right now. So, what I want from a model of 3D Euler is all these same features geometrically, because the geometry is what I care about. So, I want a smooth exponential map. And I want this exponential map to be not fret uh, Typically, in almost every geodesic equation you can think of, if I've got smoothness, I get fret homeness for free. 3D Euler is the only case where that fails, um, at least until this, this model I'm going to discuss. I want it to have some energy, which is conserved. 
course, fluids have this. Uh, if I allow for, so even in 2D, if I allow for infinite energy solutions, um, I can certainly get blow. It's really easy to get 2D blow up in the Euler equation if I allow infinite energy. So the finite conservation of energy is really important for what I actually care about. Um, I want some term, I want something that's a vorticity, which I allow to be stretched. Um, I want that vorticity to be, uh, to determine the velocity, but in some non-local way. I want some kind of uh, Biot-Savart type operator to get the velocity back out of the vorticity. And finally, I want the vorticity to control blow in the same way uh, as the Biot Kato Maida criteria. Right? If the vorticity remains finite, then everything should be fine. So, there's only one model, uh, there's only one other PDE that has all these features. Uh, and that is uh, what I call the Wunsch equation, which at long last, 25 minutes later, is the topic of this talk. So, here is the Wunsch equation. In vorticity, there are a few forms I can write it in. Uh, in the vorticity form, it looks like this. So it's a one-dimensional model on the circle, or it could be on the real line. Um, so I have a relation between my velocity field u and my vorticity omega. Omega is determined from u by uh, that operator, which is I take a derivative and then I apply the Hilbert transform. So um, why this? Well, because I'm trying to get something that looks like a curl. Uh, and of course, I can't take the curl in one dimension. I need some derivative and then a rotation. Um, and the only way I can get a rotation is something non local like the Hilbert transform. Uh, the, the, the inspiration for this model is not so much omega in terms of u, but u in terms of omega. Uh, so I'll discuss the details of the Hilbert transform in a second, uh, but basically Hilbert transform is negative of its own inverse. And so it's the inverse that I'm trying to reproduce. I want u in terms of omega to look like a Biot-Savart law, and that's what the Hilbert transform is. So the Hilbert transform looks like this horrible, ugly formula. Um, in terms of some integral operator, I have to take a principal value because it's too singular. Um, and this is just the definition of that principal value. In, on the real line, this is simpler. So the, on the real line, this would just be 1 over theta minus uh, psi. Um, but periodicity makes things a little bit simpler, working on a compact manifold. So this is supposed to look a lot like the B of Savar operator, like I said. Um, it's a lot easier to understand the Hilbert transform in terms of Fourier coefficients. So I can just take uh, f in terms of its Fourier series, then the Hilbert transform will just be minus i times sine of n uh, times the Fourier coefficient. So um, some background on the Hilbert transform in case you're not too familiar with it. Uh, so first of all, the motivation for the Hilbert transform, what Hilbert was originally thinking when he invented it, was um, about solving harmonic equations. Uh, so you if, if you have some function defined on the, on the circle, so specify a function f on the circle and then find a harmonic phi whose boundary values are that function. Uh, and of course, you can do that uniquely. Um, if phi is harmonic, then it has a harmonic conjugate, and you can specify that uniquely up to some constant. Um, so it satisfies cauchy riemann equations. And then if you put them together, you get an analytic function. So there's a unique analytic function whose real part has specified boundary values on the disk. And then just look at the imaginary part of that function. So the imaginary part on the boundary will give you some other function. Um, and as I said, it's uniquely determined up, up to a constant. I can specify that constant by just saying its integral is 0. So this you need f to be continuous. What's that? You need f to be continuous, right? Um, the assumption. Yes. I, so I, I actually want f to be smooth. Um, but I think continuity is uh, sufficient. Um, right, so G is the Hilbert transform of F if there's some complex analytic capital F such that on the boundary, capital F looks like this. For example, the Hilbert transform of cosine is the sine, and the Hilbert transform of the sine is minus the cosine, and that's the rotation that I was talking about. So, very nice properties of the Hilbert transform. Uh, if your function has mean 0, then if you square the Hilbert transform, you get minus 1. Because if f is analytic, then so is i times f. Uh, and you have this magical product formula for the Hilbert transform because you have a product formula for analytic functions. 
product of two analytic functions is still analytic. And so the immediate consequence of that is this formula for product of Hilbert transforms, which is very useful. Um, if I define lambda to be h times td theta, uh, that is a symmetric operator um, just by this calculation, uh, because of course the Hilbert transform of anything integrates to zero. And also lambda is positive definite because I can just plug in e to the i n theta, it's an orthogonal basis of eigenvectors, and the eigenvalue is absolute value of n, so it's positive. Um, it's a little bit mysterious how you prove that lambda is positive definite immediately, right? Like, magically, I have some basis of eigenvectors, uh, and that gives it to me, but there should be some direct proof, uh, which is actually part of the talk uh, that will come a little bit later. Uh, a direct proof of that is a consequence of something more interesting. So anyway, that's a symmetric positive definite operator, and I can use it to define a Riemannian metric. H1 half dot metric, um, the dot denoting there's some degeneracy, right? Because it's killing all the <coughs> vector fields. So this defines a Riemannian metric on the space of non-zero vector fields. And if I consider the group of diffeomorphisms under composition, um, there's a basic manifold structure for it. Uh, the tangent spaces look like Take some vector field, compose it with eta, and that's a tangent vector in the diffeomorphism group. In particular, the identity, it's just vector fields. Uh, left translation looks like this. Right translation is easier. Notice left translation involves a derivative, and that breaks lots of things. Uh, but right translation does not, it's easy. So I can define a right invariant metric on the diffeomorphism group by just taking my elements of uh, tangent space at eta pushing them back to the identity, and then taking the inner product there. So work out what is the GDS equation on this diffeomorphism group. And it splits into two parts. Um, so it's a second order equation, of course. But right invariance allows me to split it up into two separate equations. Um, and this always happens. If you have a right invariant uh, metric on a diffeomorphism group or on any group, uh, you'll get two different equations. One is just a flow equation for eta in terms of u, and the second equation doesn't involve eta at all, that's the group invariance. Uh, and it looks like this. And this is quite general. You take any, any metric at all on a diffeomorphism group, we'll give you this equation just for possibly different choices of omega in terms of u. So the Wunsch equation is if you choose omega to be uh, lambda u, where lambda looks like this, as I mentioned. So, some other examples of the same situation, uh, if you have lambda's 1, uh, you just get Berger's equation for the euler arnold equation. If lambda is 1 minus the second derivative, you get the kamasa holm equation, um, which is a fairly well-known equation for water waves. Uh, another equation for water waves is the KDB equation, the de degrees, um, and that's lambda equals 1 on the bach virasor group, one-dimensional extension of the diffeomorphism group, the circle. Um, and if you just have something degenerate, like minus d theta squared, you get the Hunter-Saxon equation. So these are all um, interesting models. They all have something in common with the Euler equation, but they're not as special as the one I'm talking about. And finally, if you're working on the volume-preserving diffeomorphism group, then uh, you get the Euler equation, which is what we really care about. So why do you study PDEs as GNS equations? Why is the geometry interesting? Um, well, it's pretty. Geometry is pretty. I don't need to explain at Stony Brook why I study geometry, or why stick geometry in something else, even if it doesn't belong. Um, that's what we do. Uh, but it gives us some tools. So we can compute curvature, for example. Um, and so I can study stability of trajectories. I can study. If I have, if I'm trying to predict the weather using the 3D Euler equation, um, I know I can't do it. I can't predict the weather more than a couple weeks in advance. Uh, and Arnold's idea was that that's because of instability, because of negative curvature on this diffeomorphism group. So there's lots and lots of negative curvature, and that's what creates exponential divergence of geodesics and makes the weather impossible to predict. Also, you can prove well poses, right? Like, if you don't know any PDE techniques, but you know how to solve ODEs, then you can try and use this picture to get yourself an ODE, and things work easily. Uh, and finally, you can understand law and weak solutions 
from a geometric point of view, which is a little bit harder to, to understand from purely the PPE point of view. Um, okay, so I'll, I'll sketch a little bit of the well post in this picture. Um, so here's how do you prove well post in this without knowing anything about PDEs. Write down the vorticity equation. Um, notice that it's not an ODE, right? When I just start off, I of course do not have an ODE in terms of omega or in terms of t, or in terms of u, because this operator involves a derivative, and of course the derivative is not a continuous operator in any Banach space. Um, so by itself, I do not have an ODE. But when I put in the flow, I get an ODE uh, for, for, uh, for that uh, second order differential equation. So this equation, these two things together become just the derivative of the transported vorticity. And then this term becomes this, uh, just composing with air. And so this is an equation I can solve for omega. In fact, I can get rid of u theta by just writing it in terms of derivatives of eta. And this can be solved as this conservation law. So that is my fundamental vorticity stretching term. Right? Vorticity can grow because eta sub theta can shrink to 0. And then if I do this, I can solve for um, my velocity field. Velocity field is minus over transform of omega, and I can get back to the whole thing in terms of eta. Uh, and so the derivative of eta is some complicated operator uh, in terms of the initial vorticity. All I have to do is figure out, I don't want to do anything with that operator. I just want to figure out if it's continuous. And it is. It actually it depends smoothly on eta, and this is how you solve the ODE. So you basically take your simple equation, make it much more complicated, but that complicated picture has nice properties, even if you can't solve it explicitly. So here's a picture of um, how you can actually understand the log from the geometric point of view, where geometry actually helps you. The best example we have of any euler armour equation is the Hunter-Saxon equation. And this is due to Jonathan Lennels uh, in the mid-2000s, about 10 years ago. Uh, and what he found is that uh, if you compute the sectional curvature, it's actually constant, which never happens, uh, except in this one case. Uh, it pretty much never happens that you take a left invariant or right invariant metric on a group, and you get constant sectional curvature out of that, right? as, uh, as you're probably aware. But by some miracle, you get positive constant sectional curvature. If your sectional curvature is a positive constant, then your space should be a sphere. Right? Uh, so then all he had to do was figure out what's the correspondence with the sphere. And he figured out that the isometry is you take your diffeomorphism eta, the square root of its derivative is some positive function. And the integral of its square is 1 because the integral of eta, the integral of the derivative of eta is 1. It's just the length of your circle. And so that's your condition to be a sphere. Right? You're looking at the space of all rows such that the integral of rho squared is 1. That's the Hilbert sphere. Um, and what, so what he pointed out is that this, this map is actually a Riemannian isometry. And what it tells you is, so where do you end up in the sphere? You do not get arbitrary functions rho. You can only get positive functions, right? Because the derivative of eta must be positive. Its square root's also positive. And so you get a function that's positive at every point. What portion of the sphere is it? It's like the positive octant, right? The, the portion with, with Say in R3, the portion with all positive components. Um, but this is the infinite dimensional version. So you're dealing with the, I don't know what the infinite dimensional version of octant is, but the, the positive portion, the very tiny portion in the infinite dimensional sphere where all uh, values are positive. So if you start a geodesic in that portion of the sphere, uh, say here, of course it will leap, right? Every geodesic will leap, and that means your uh, your solution is leaving the diffeomorphism group, which is blow up, right? It's no longer smooth. And what happens? Well, if you, if you just took this and pretended it was still serious, you could square it, right? Square this to get back to eta, and what would you end up with? Your picture in the actual space of diffeomorphisms would look like this. Uh, you reach the edge in finite time, and then you just bounce off and come back, 
and you keep bouncing off. So what it actually looks like is, so here's the blow-up picture for Hunter Saxton. Uh, your velocity field, U, looks like this, right? And the finite time it reaches, um, it has a cusp. Uh, and that's a singularity, of course. What does the flow look like? Well, it's a... This point here turns into just a uh, horizontal point in eta. Right? So the derivative of eta is zero. Eta is smooth. It's just not a diffeomorphism uh, at this one point. And that's what blow up looks like for these sorts of equations. That you leave the diffeomorphism group, but you end up just on the boundaries of the diffeomorphism group, and you can come back uh, later on using a weak solution. And the geometry makes this picture really, really clear. It's harder to prove from the PDE point of view. OK, so what's the same sort of thing look like for the Wunsch equation? Um, well, the Wunsch equation looks like this if I write it explicitly in terms of the Hilbert transform. Um, and writing that out, taking the Hilbert transform on both sides, I get this. So some acceleration terms, pretty simple. This term, which is vorticity, conserved. And this ugly mess of a term. And I can write this out. I can recognize these two terms as being part of uh, just this. Right? The second derivative in time of the derivative of the spatial derivative of eta. Uh, right? So in the same way that I can turn my complicated left-hand side of the Euler equation into just a nice simple second derivative, um, I can do the same thing here, turn this complicated thing into something simple in terms of the Lagrangian picture. So this equation becomes this, where my right-hand side is some complicated thing given by this formula. So I can say, okay, left-hand side looks easy, but I don't know what to do with the right-hand side. So I don't know how to analyze this equation. Uh, but notice if I did know anything about the right-hand side, using the conservation law here, I would get the ermakov pini equation again, um, just almost by accident. So the significance of this, now, as I mentioned, any idiot can propose a one-dimensional model of 3D Euler and say this has this stuff in common. Um, and I am also an idiot who has proposed a similar model. But this model is special because for free, even though I wasn't asking for it, I get ermakov penny again, right? which is the same, same equation that I get when I'm studying uh, 3D Euler on the axis. Just, I wasn't asking for that. It just magically fell out. Um, so. The picture, as I drew over there, is I have some planar harmonic oscillator, and I'm asking whether it can go spiral around towards the origin in finite time. Uh, so for example, that's a picture. If I have some force on the right hand side and it's blowing up, then I can, uh, then this radius will approach zero in finite time. If the force does not blow up, I cannot, I can, of course, not get a singularity on this. Uh, except in a special case when omega naught is zero. So, um, in order to say anything about this, I need to know something about this mystery force. The mystery force looks like this ugly formula, which looks like nothing. However, it turns out, by some miracle, which I do not understand, um, that that thing, well, I have this general inequality point-wise for Hilbert transforms. Uh, Hilbert transform, so, Apply two Hilbert transforms and stick in some differential operator. Here, lambda to the p uh, is basically just in, in terms of Fourier coefficients, I just take n to some power. All right, so do that to the Fourier coefficients, and whatever I end up with, it'll be a positive function. And it's essentially how I prove this is just expand this in a Fourier series um, and work it out by some miracle. Uh, it ends up looking just like this. So sum of some positive terms. Uh, when p equals 1, this, this was already known. Uh, Cordoba, Antonio Cordoba, Diego Cordoba uh, found that when p equals 1. When p equals 2, and the function is odd, then Castro and Cordoba proved this um, just at the origin. Right, so this term is 0, uh, and this term is possible when p equals 2. Um, but actually, it works in great generality. Uh, and so one consequence of this for the, for 
uh, minus mystery force is that this thing, which is this with p equals 2, of course, I have my Hilbert transform squared. Uh, Hilbert transform squared is minus 1, and that's where I'm getting this negative sign. Uh, so this thing is always negative. So my mystery force is always positive. So I've got this situation where I've got a particle trying not to blow up, right? trying to avoid the origin, but the force is always pushing it towards the origin. And the only thing that can save it is it's got some angular momentum, which is, of course, the same thing that saves us from falling into the sun. We've got some angular momentum that keeps us spinning around. Um, if you remove that angular momentum, then, of course, you just dive into the sun in finite time. Uh, and that's precisely the blow-up condition that happens here. If you've got zero vorticity, force is always pushing you towards the origin, and you blow up in some finite time. Um, so, so we can get the blow-up to happen um, in this situation. The, uh, the somewhat mysterious thing is your vorticity has to be zero for this argument to work, right? Vorticity is angular momentum. Angular momentum saves you from dying in the sun. Uh, and so, if you have zero angular momentum, then you should go right into the sun. However, if your vorticity is zero, then your Biel-Cato-Mida criterion cannot work, because Biel-Cato-Mida says vorticity should be going to infinity. So what happens is the vorticity is zero at this point, but nearby it's getting very, very large. Right, so you have this, this large slope. But it's still kind of mysterious how this happens. Um, so, as I mentioned, if vorticity is zero, you uh, basically dive into the sun. So you're satisfying your eta sub x, your derivative of beta, is satisfying some linear equation. And since f is positive, uh, this thing's negative. So you've got a function that's very, very simple. You can explain this to top one students. You've got a function, it's concave down. It starts at 1. Its initial slope is negative. Does it reach 0? Yes, of course, because compared to the, that line, and that line will hit 0, this thing's concave down, so it goes even faster than its tangent line, and that's your blow. So, um, yeah, so just diving right into the sun, yes, you will reach it. Uh, so, what we don't know is whether the, the actual spiraling blow up can happen. Um, now, I mentioned that there's numerical results on 3D Euler. What do they look like? In 3D Euler, the, the numerical simulation has odd initial velocity, therefore the velocity is always odd, and the blow up seems to happen at a point on the boundary uh, where the odd symmetry is. So it's one of these fixed points where the, the point never moves, the vorticity is zero at this point, yet in a neighborhood of it, the vorticity is going to infinity. That's numerically what seems to happen. Um, so we're seeing the same sort of picture in the 1D case, but of course in the 1D case we can actually prove blow up, not just uh, conjecture numerically. Um, by the way, it's been a while since I showed you a picture. So here's a picture. This is a numerical simulation of the Wunsch equation. Uh, all four of these are the exact same thing, they're just with different resolution because I don't know how to do numerical simulations. Um, so I think one of these is, one of these pictures should be correct. I mean, they should all be showing the same thing. They're a different resolution. So what happens is I start with an initial uh, sine curve, and I look at the origin. At the origin, so this thing's odd, at the origin, the function, the, the velocity is zero, and the vorticity is also zero. Uh, and there's a steepening that happens. So also I have, I have zero vorticity and negative slope. That's that concave down picture I drew. Um, and in that case, you can prove that it blows up in finite time. This is what it looks like as it's blowing up. As I mentioned, the velocity, so the velocity um, basically becomes, velocity is always finite, but its derivative becomes infinite. So I have this uh, sort of, um, well, infinite slope uh, right at that point. And after that, everything sort of goes to hell. Um, do not know how genuine that is or if it's just numerical artifacts. Uh, but that's related to the question of when blow-up happens, even if blow-up happens at just one point, if I try to continue past that, uh, does it still make sense? Or does everything blow up simultaneously? Can I continue 
to extend things in, say, a weak way uh, for all time, or does everything immediately stop being smooth and nothing makes sense anymore? Still open, but no idea. But I think it would be very interesting to solve. So, um, to try and convince you of the similarities of these two equations. As I mentioned, the, uh, I've, got a, I've got a smooth Riemannian exponential map. Okay. Does not always happen. Just because I, I make a picture of something that's a GNS equation doesn't mean it's actually going to be rigorously uh, smooth ODE in a proper bonding space. But it works for this. Um, the exponential map is not Fredholm. Which, so, what does Fredholmness mean? In, we don't have a great sense of what it means. I mean, we, you know, we can prove that something is or is not Fredholm, but we don't know what the consequences are. Um, at least one of the consequences is that uh, you can get um, surjectivity of the exponential map, which is to say, if I want to reach some final configuration, can I choose my initial velocity field uh, and send a geodesic in that direction and get there? In finite dimensions, that's the hopf now theorem. In infinite dimensions, all that falls apart, and I only ever get that sort of result if I really, really work for it. Um, so the proof, Schneerman has a proof of this for two-dimensional fluids, which uses Fred Holmness in, a, in an essential way. Um, and so that's one of the consequences of Fred Holmness. They both have, so as I said, I want an equation not to be Fred Holm in order to be a good model of 3D oil, because 3D oil is the only other one that has a smooth map that's not Fred Holm. So I, I think that's important, and I want to imitate that. I've got a vorticity conservation law. I've got a Beal Cato minor criteria. Um, I've got a flow map that satisfies Fermikoff pinning. Uh, and I say sometimes here because for my 1D model, it always does. For a 3D Euler, there's only one situation where it does, but there's at least one. And finally, I get a distance bound. That's another geometric property. Um, it turns out the Wunsch equation actually has zero distance, which is a weird infinite dimensional phenomenon. If I take two diffeomorphisms and find the infimum of lengths of curves joining them, I get zero. No one says that can't happen. You're dealing with weak Riemannian metrics. You're only measuring h1 half uh, distance, and it's not strong enough to tell you that these things are actually spread apart. So just, you know, I like to see weird infinite dimensional things happening in my models, because weird infinite dimensional things happen for 3D oil. And I'm trying to imitate as much of that, of that as I can. So here's a picture of non-Fred Holmes. This is what happens when you have lots and lots of conjugate points. Here, I've got a hypnotic sort of picture. I've got a, a flow, just very simple flow. It's, the flow is moving to the right. And then I take a conjugate point, I take a Jacobi field along this flow. And I measure, uh, can the Jacobi field grow from zero and then shrink back to zero? Of course, that's a conjugate point. So not only can I have that, but I have infinitely many of them. So this is just three of them, like, say, in Euclid's elements, where you do one, two, three, infinite. Um, same sort of thing. I can't draw infinitely many, so I stop with three. Uh, so you've got infinitely many perturbations, which will all, uh, so you've got all these geodesics spreading apart, and then at later time, pi, they all come back together again. That's a failure for all this. Um, so, I've mentioned the similarities between 3D Euler and this 1D Wunsch equation. Uh, and I want, you know, in order to understand 3D Euler, I want to be able to understand the, the Wunsch equation. And I have, of course, much more hope to be able to understand that simpler model. So the open questions about the Wunsch equation are, uh, first of all, I showed you a geodesic that ends in finite time. And in fact, there are lots of them that do. But I don't know if everyone does. Uh, and I would really like to know. Right. Do they all end in finite time, or do some of them exist globally? Secondly, um, if I have a geodesic, so if I have a blow blowing up solution, I have a geodesic that's ending in finite time, what's happening to the conjugate points along the way? Uh, for 3D Euler, if I've got something that's blowing up, the relationship between Gil Cato Mida and Fred Holm tells me that there's a bunch of conjugate points along the way. Right? Uh, geodesic fails to be minimizing on ever shorter intervals. And that's a picture of how, the, uh, how a geodesic ends its life. Um, does the same thing happen in the Wunsch equation? I think so, but it's not quite proven yet. Thirdly, um, I've got vanishing geodesic distance. I've got failure of Fred Holmness. We suspect 
that those two things are related. But there's no direct proof that one implies the other, uh, unfortunately. Uh, fourth question, what happens near the blow-up location? Right? I can tell you exactly what happens at the blow-up location, but I don't know what happens nearby. Uh, and that's, of course, really essential to know, especially if I'm trying to figure out what happens to 3D Euler. I don't want to figure out what happens just at this point, because nothing happens at the point. What's interesting is what happens nearby. Uh, well, next question, um, as I mentioned, in, for the Hunter-Saxon equation, the diffeomorphism will stop being a diffeomorphism, but will still be smooth, a smooth function. So I can continue that as a weak solution for all time. Uh, does the same thing happen here? Right? So even if the thing stops being a diffeomorphism, is it still a smooth function? Um, I don't know. And lastly, and probably the most important thing, I have this magic inequality for Hilbert transforms. What does that have to do with the Euler equation? Well, the Euler equation has the same sort of structure uh, going on, except instead of Hilbert transforms, there are Riesz transforms. Because um, I have higher dimensions, so I have to worry about uh, possibly different directions. Uh, and the, where the Riesz transform comes in is when I try to get the pressure Hessian out of the, the velocity field. Right? I've got to invert the Laplacian to get a pressure and then take two derivatives to get the Hessian. Um, is there some magic inequality for that operation like this? I mean, no one expected this until, until it was discovered. Uh, and so quite possibly there's a similar sort of magic inequality for the higher dimensional version. If so, that's it. That's blow up. Like, we've proved blow up if there's a, any, anything similar in higher dimensions to this magic inequality. So that's a big open question which I'd love to try and solve. Uh, and that is all I have. Thanks very much for your time. So I'm, I'm basically just looking at it on the circle, right? And so I'm, I'm really just looking at the boundary values. Whatever's inside, I don't know. Like, so I, I haven't been able to use. But, but I suspect that's what's making it work. So the proof of circle determinism has some complex Yeah, in fact, if, if you take the H3 halves metric, um, as, as, as Leon certainly uh, is, uh, has worked on, you get the, um, the, the Wild Peterson metric. Right? And the, the GS equation for that looks basically the same as this, except with a, a different operator lambda. Um, and that, of course, has a very well known complex structure. Uh, so I, I don't know if there's a way to use the same sort of picture to understand this better. Um, certainly, there's, there's some sort of rotation going on, right? Like the, the 3D and the 1D picture look essentially the same because they both reduce to the 2D picture, right? Which is this spiraling around towards the origin. That's probably where the complex structure is. Um, but I don't know the direct way to see it. Any other questions? We have reservations for dinner tonight at 6.45 at the fifth season in Port Jefferson. Please see me if you want to come. It's on the house.